Hello, everyone. My name is Mihai Budiu. I am a researcher at VMR Research. I'm also currently co-chairing the P4 Language Design Group. It is my pleasure to introduce the next presentation for our workshop. Uh, this is called Primitives for Finite Field Arithmetic in Network Switches. And the work is done by an international team, uh, and, but we have two speakers this time. They are both from uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, we will have uh, Daniel Sierra and uh, Bernardo Conde. I'm very eager to find out about this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Bernardo. And I'm here with Daniel Sierra, and we're going to present Primitives for Finite Field Arithmetic in Network Switches. So uh, first, uh, a bit of a primer on what is finite field arithmetic. So conventional, conventional arithmetic operations are done over infinite fields. So your sums, your addition, uh, your multiplications, your divisions. Um, however, it is very common to want to perform these operations over fields that contain a finite number of elements, right? So I want to be able to perform multiple operations that I don't know how many, but that the result is always going to be bounded in a certain, you know, in a certain finite of space. So, for example, think of a signature in a cryptographic operation. We, have, we may have a lot of data, but we want to put it in the signature that fits into a, a set of data of known size, for example, 128 bits. Every time we need this, we need to perform finite field arithmetic. Uh, so, what is finite field arithmetic? So, a field is a set of numbers with well-defined basic operations. So, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. For example, the field of real numbers. Finite means that the set has a finite number of elements. So, for example, the real numbers have an infinite number of elements, so they're not finite fields. And we also know that in the literature, finite fields are referenced as Galois fields. And they're normally uh, a field over the natural numbers, module uh, P over K, where P is a prime. We really care about Galois fields where P is 2. So, because that gives us a, a, a really easy way of showing all the numbers that fit into K bits. So, for example, GF 2 to the power of 4 gives us a way of showing all the numbers that fit in four bits. Uh, operations in these fields output results that are different from common, uh, from common arithmetic. And this is because all these operations have to output a number that is part of the field. So what happens when, for example, we have an addition that goes over the boundary, right? Three, three, 321 is not in the field. So what do we do? We need to redefine all of these operations so they conform uh, to this, you know, invariant that they have to output a number that is part of the field. So here are the, all the the correct outputs for for all of these uh, operations. Uh, now we're going to talk about the design approaches uh, to implement these these primitives in the network switches. So uh, we're going to talk about log and anti-log tables and uh, the Russian peasant algorithm. Uh, we'll show that these approaches aren't really feasible. And we will try to show a way forward. We will end with a, a conclusion and uh, time for questions. So, what are the design approaches for network switches? So, if you want to do addition and subtraction, right, in finite fields of GF2 to the M, it's very simple. It's just a simple bitwise XOR. XOR has the properties of addition and subtraction, and also always outputs a number that is uh, in, in the field, which is great. It's very easy. Simple than before. Multiplication is much harder, right? There are two main approaches. One that is very memory intensive, that uses log and anti-log tables, and another one that is very computative intensive, that, for example, in our case, uses the, the Russian peasant algorithm. Uh, note, we're going to just talk about multiplication. Uh, division is very similar to multiplication because dividing A by B, by B is just the same as multiplying A by the inverse of B, right? So, so let's start with the table method, with the memory method. So the idea is to use logarithm tables to turn multiplication into additions. We, we've already shown that additions are pretty easy. So if we could turn multiplication into additions, that would be great, right? Uh, we know that the logarithm of A times B is the same as the logarithm of A plus the logarithm of B. So if we have a function that is the anti-log that reverses the log, we can write A times B is equal to the anti-log of the log of A times B which would be the same as writing the anti-log of the log A plus the log of B, right? So let's show an example. Let's multiply 10 by 25. So we have 10 and 25. We go onto the table of all the pre-computed values of the logarithms, and we get the values for the logarithm of 10 and the logarithm of 25. 
we got uh, 1b at 71, and then we add them. It's now 8c. So now we have the value of the, the sum of the logarithms of a and b. Now we want to reverse. We want to put it, into, we want to do the anti log. So we go into the anti log table and we get the value, which would be fa, which is 250. Here is a result. We only need three, look, three lookups. That's it. This is great, but uh, it does not scale with respect to memory. So if we want to do it in the G, in the Galois field of two to the eight, we only need two hundred and fifty six bytes per table. But if we need, but if we want to do it, do these operations in the fields of two to the power of one hundred and twenty eight, right? We need ten to the thirty nine bytes of memory. So this does not scale. It you know it goes crazy in the, with the memory. So. All right, we can't use memory, so let's try to compute it and let's be intelligent and use the number decomposition. We use the Russian peasant algorithm. The Russian peasant algorithm uh, makes use of the fact that while multiplying might be hard, multiplying by two or dividing by two is pretty easy. It's normally just a shift operation, right? So we do this multiple times. Uh, we know that A times B is equal to two times A times B divided by two. And we do this iteratively, iteratively until B is, until we can't, can do any more Bs. So let's try to multiply 10 by 25 using this method. So we have 10, we have 25, we have the P, which is the accumulator. So we're going to put a result there. So uh, if the last digit of B is 1, we add A to P. All right, let's continue. Then we try to multiply, uh, we check if the multiplication of A by 2 is bounded. Because if it isn't, we need to bound it again, right? So in this case, we can multiply by two, it's fine. So let's multiply by two and let's divide B by two. Okay, iteration two. Uh, B, the, the last digit of B is not a one, so we don't need to add. A is still bounded, let's continue. So we multiply A and divide B. Again, same thing, we multiply A and, and divide B again. It's fine. Okay, now the, the last digit of B is one, so we need to add A to B to, to continue the operation. So let's go. A is still bounded, by the way, so we can continue. We can multiply A by 2 and divide B by 1. Again, last digit of B is 1, so add to, to P. And now, if we multiply A by 2, this would uh, this would result in a, you know, it would be unbounded. So we need to bound it by removing a re an irreducible polynomial. It's a special type of operation that allows us to preserve the, 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 the invariance of the multiplication while still, uh, you know, making it bounded. So B is zero, so we are done. And now we have P in, in the accumulator, which is the result of the multiplication. So this has apparent issues with that, with that the computation has multiple data dependencies that require many pipeline stages, right? And the larger fields, the more iterations we need. So the, the number of iterations is linear with the number of bits of to, that we need to represent the, the field, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, it's not exponentially like the, the problems with the memory in the, in the tables, but you know, implementations of large fields are not really suitable for current talking to switches. Talking to doesn't really like doing a lot of iteratively uh, algorithms. It just likes to read a, a number from a table and output it. So uh, we have a proof of concept that consumes 16 stages for multiplication in the in GF to, to the A. Okay, so now let's look at the way forward. And what did we just see? We have seen that modern switch architectures are not good enough for generic finite fields. And what do we mean by generic finite fields? We mean fields that have that have a larger size than just two to the power of eight or even two to the power of 16. Because for example, for cryptographic operations, in order to maintain some of the properties that they need, we need to work with at least 128 bits, and so GF 2 to the power of 128. But other switch architectures have been proposed recently, and most of them showcase more computational power and are able to, to do more operations. And the question that we asked ourselves for this work is, can we leverage any of these new architectures in, a, in order to be actually able to perform finite field operations in larger finite field sizes. And a preliminary investigation has led us to an architecture called Taurus that is actually a good candidate for this. But what is Taurus? So basically Taurus is defined as a data plane architecture that is capable of 
uh, doing machine learning inference and running machine learning modules in the data plane in every packet. And the way it is able to do this, and most importantly, the way it is able to do this and maintain line rate of the switches is with this MapReduce operation and this MapReduce abstraction. Why? Because with MapReduce, we can leverage single instruction multiple data and single instruction multiple data gives us a lot of parallelism cheaply versus what current switches have uh, to perform operations, which is normally very long instruction words. It is important to note, actually, that in the Taurus architecture, the parsing, the pre-processing, the post-processing, and the scheduling of packets all remain the same as common architectures. It is just that middle block, that MapReduce block, that suffers the most changes. Let's look a little bit into MapReduce operations. So, MapReduce are two different things. One is Map which performs uh, element-wise operations in a vector. So for example, multiply one, each element of the vector by a value, add each element of a vector by a value, et cetera, et cetera. And then the reduce operations that, that take a vector of elements and reduce them to a single scalar value, either by summation, either by other operation. And so since Taurus was mainly done to perform machine learning, we have an example here of MapReduce for a common perceptron where we have the map stage, where each input is multiplied by a weight, so a map operation, and then we have a reduce operation that combines all of these results together into a single scalar before passing it on to the activation function. And actually, the authors of this paper have already proposed a control block in P4 to perform map reduce that sits in between the pre-processing that we know and the post-processing that we also know from current architectures. And this, this control block is capable of loading the weights, performing the map operation of multiplying each input by each weight, and then reducing it all together in a summation. But how does it actually do this? So let's live, dive a little bit deeper. So this MapReduce block is based on a CGRA, a coarse-grain reconfigurable architecture called Plasticine, which is also proposed. And it mainly has compute units and memory units. So the compute units are the ones actually responsible for performing the arithmetic operations. And inside each compute unit, we have functional units that perform one operation, and we have pipeline registers. And these pipeline registers are the ones that, also, that allow this pipelining architecture that we know from common uh, switches and allows that, that, that the operations run at line rate. So that one functional unit performs an arithmetic operation and loads the value into a pipeline register. The next functional unit reads from that pipeline register and then writes into the other pipeline register and so on and so on. And the values go through this pipeline and exit on the other side. Then we also have lanes. Lanes are that multiple data parts of CIMD because each lane is loaded with a value. Then it then goes to the functional units. And then we have stages and the stages are the single operation because each stage performs one operation, one addition on one multiplication. And then we can have one stage performing a map operation, one stage performing a reduce operation and so on and so on, maintaining this pipeline architecture that we know. Other than that, we have memory units, and memory units are actually just simple banked SRAMs that are interspersed with the CUs. And why? Because they act like those course, they, are, they act like pipeline registers at a coarser grain, so that we maintain that pipelining architecture, so that in the speeds of one gigahertz, which is proposed by the paper, we can actually ensure nanosecond level latencies which for modern switches that work with data rates in the order of terabits per second. This is an actual requirement, so we need nanosecond level latencies. This is actually an example of what the full mesh of CUs and MUs can look like. As you can see, the MUs are spread among the CUs so that the value arrives to an MU, is read by the CU, the CU writes to another MU, which then is read from another CU, and so on and so on, maintaining that pipelining that we know, and that is the requirement. So what is our current research question? What do you want with this? We asked ourselves if we can leverage any of these compute units and what Taurus has proposed to execute the iterations that are required by the Russian peasant algorithm. And actually, if we can leverage the single instruction multiple data parallelism 
we might be able to perform multiple operations in parallel, multiple multiplications in parallel, instead of just one at a time. So let's remember that the Russian peasant algorithm is an iterative algorithm. This means that we have one iteration that produce some results that then need to pass on to the next iteration, which produce some results, which then produce to the next iteration, and so on and so on. And we can hypothesize that each compute unit is in charge of performing one iteration of RPA. As such, if we are working with the field two to the power of eight, we only need eight compute units. If you are working with the field two to the power of 16, we need 16 compute units. And if we, uh, we want to work with the field two to the power of 128, we need 128 CUs. And actually, the number of lanes that we have talked about in each CU dictate how many multiplications can we do in parallel. And so the figure we, we have here does exactly that. One other thing that is important to note is that the number of stages per compute unit is configurable as well. And that remember that in our Tofino proof of concept, we were able to perform each iteration of Russian peasant algorithm using two stages. And in this figure, we have four. We did not come up with this, with this configuration. It is also in the Tauros paper for their test bed, they use exactly four stages per CU. And actually they use 16 lanes per CU and we have reduced them to eight. But if we can have four stages per CU and we can have uh, each iteration of RPA only taking up two iterations, then of course we can cut the number of compute units in half. And so instead of needing 128 CUs for GF two to the power of 128, we might just need 64 CUs and we have cut the number of compute units needed in half. So now that we have this, what are our next steps? What do you want to do moving forward in this research? So we are actually currently working on a proof of concept that runs the Russian peasant algorithm in Taurus and not only just in Taurus, but maybe on a new kind of architecture that is based on Taurus and this map reduce abstraction. And we actually want to investigate afterwards the division operation and what we need to do. As we have said, division is just a multiplication by the inverse of one of the operands. And so if we can find an algorithm that computes the inverse of a number, we then perform Russian peasant algorithm and we have our division operation. We have already found an algorithm that is capable of doing exactly that. And so we are working on an implementation, not only for Taurus, but actually a proof of concept as well in Tofino so that we can see how long we can go uh, in, the, in the size of the finite field. So to conclude this presentation, we have seen that primitives for finite field operations are required by a lot of networking applications, either being cryptography, either being network coding or others, and that the current switch architectures that we have make it really hard to implement these operations for larger fields. And this is due to those memory or computational constraints that we have talked about in this presentation. And that maybe these new architectures, possibly Taurus based, are a solution that is worth exploring so that we can produce these finite field operations. And so we open now the floor to your questions and thank you very much. Yeah, so I have, I have quite a few questions. So one thing you didn't have uh, time to elaborate too much is uh, you mentioned some applications, but uh, I was wondering in typical applications, what is the size of the field that people use? And also if uh, doing one operation is enough where you actually need to do multiple operations and how would you plan to implement a program that does uh, a sequence of operations? Okay, so I think I can answer this. So in the terms, for example, of AES and cryptographic operations, like performing the AES in the, in the data plane. And so it is actually a project Bernardo is working on that, uh, that does, needs to do cryptographic operations in the data plane, which is Scion, right, Bernardo? Yes. Yeah, and so in order to maintain uh, the cryptographic uh, properties that we need for security and for, and for confidentiality, we need to work with at least 128 bits. And so we need, if we want to do finite field operations for cryptography, we need at least to work with 128 bits and we cannot uh, partition that into several operations of, for example, 16 bits. We need to actually work with the numbers that fit within 128 bits. And for several operations, for example, for network coding, several operations is the norm because you want to combine several packets into one single linear combination. 
And so if you have, for example, 10 packets, you need to multiply each packet by a coefficient and each multiplication is a finite field multiplication. And then we need to sum them all together into one value, which is also finite field addition. And so, for example, in the real case of network coding, which is the case that I'm studying most, that idea of using the lanes uh, in the CUs to perform several multiplications at the same time, uh, it's feasible. You put, all, uh, you put all of the coefficients in all of the packets in the lanes, all of them, all of them go back and end up all with the multiplications done, and then you can do the final reduce with that final summation in order to have the final linear combination value. Another question I have is uh, about, so usually you apply this to the payload of a packet, right? To the data, not, not to the headers. But P4 is notoriously uh, uh, weak when handling payloads. So I expect you will need some extensions to get access to the data in the payloads and treat it as a byte stream. Yeah, I be we believe so too. Actually, in the test bed of Taurus, so the architecture that we have seen, all of that in the test bed they use, of course, all of the part to work in the anomaly detection and to work with them, they work with the payload because it's not P4 that does the map reduce operations, is the FPGA that they are using and the code of the FPGA that simulates what is happening in the switch. And so in that case of that test bed, they can and they can use the payloads. Of course, if you want to work with P4, we need extensions to be able to access the payloads. Well, maybe you need a mixed solution, which use P4 for some parts of the packet processing and some other yes. languages for the rest. For example. And do you have a, a, how do you use the TORS? Do you have a simulator or is there a chip fabricated that you can try for experiments? Yes, that's exactly what we are trying to do. So in the original paper that we have linked in the presentation and that people can go and watch, the test bed that they used to showcase how Taurus work is that they had one Tofino switch and one FPGA. And so they sent a packet through the Tofino switch, the packet exits the, the switch and goes to the FPGA and then recirculates back to the switch so that we simulate the uh, parsing and pre-processing, goes to the FPGA and then we simulate the post-processing and the scheduling. And so that is also the test bed we are trying to, to use as well in order to have a proof of, a proof of concept that actually works so that we can send a packet through a switch. It goes from, it goes to the switch to the FPGA. We execute those operations in the CUs and MUs, and then it goes back to the switch and it goes to the next hop of the, of the path. I see. So the, whatever solution you're producing will be actually a relatively sophisticated system comprising not just a switch with additional hardware. Yeah, exactly. The saving grace for us is that the authors of the of the paper, so actually Shabazz, one of the main authors of the paper, has done it for, for his paper. And so we have a direct line in order to ask him questions on how to actually do this correctly. One thing, uh, one reason I'm saying that is that uh, a large part of the P4 ecosystem is uh, an open source. And I was uh, wondering whether uh, once you have a, maybe a library for uh, Galois field arithmetic, whether you consider contributing it uh, to the community. Although if you need special hardware to run it, you know, the, um, then it's less clear how you can do that. Yeah, I, I think we, can, we will, we will if, we, if we have that library, I see no problem in opening up open source so that other people can use and maybe even help us extend it and making sure everything is okay. I see. And uh, uh, so the FPGA plus Tofino uh, solution is uh, an emulation of Torus, or is? Yes. And exactly. the, the FPGA is programmed in Verilog, I suspect. Well, actually, they programmed the FPGA in Spatial, which is an even higher level language for, for um, FPGAs that then translates to Verilog. And so the... We actually are working on a, on a special implementation of the RPA algorithm, which we then want to make sure it works in Taurus and to extract the metrics from there. I have one, one last question. I think many chips today have uh, AES acceleration. And supposedly if you build an ASIC, uh, it can be quite efficient for Galois field. I don't know if it can scale to large sizes for the words, 
but uh, do you know if uh, a solution in a, such a device is uh, competitive in power, for example, or area with the custom design? We don't know. We need we needed to actually put it working in Taurus and uh, figuring out how much area it would occupy to then be able to draw those conclusions. But we think so, and let's see. It's it's a case of actually implementing it and having a proof of concept working, so that we can extract those numbers and have a real comparison. So I guess we'll be looking to uh, for a future contribution to the before workshop where you report the results of this experiment. I, we would very much like so, I think. <laughs>